Hey, I'm Boyd Barrett, and um, my side gig for the past two or three years has been uh, audiobook narration. I've learned a, a bunch about the whole process, which I love, and uh, and I've met a lot of people in the narrator community, which is wonderfully supportive. But I've also gotten to know some outstanding authors. And uh, I believe the one person who knows an author's book almost as well as the author themselves is the voice that gets to narrate them. So uh, I'm, I'm going to be interviewing some of the authors I've narrated for and introduce you to them and their work. Today, I'm talking with John LeMay, who's from right here in Roswell, where I am. Hey, John, welcome. Hey, Boyd. Nice to see you over the Zoom call. Yeah, absolutely. I'm I, I'm excited about uh, getting into some of this stuff. Um, now, for those of you who don't know, John is the author of, we were just talking before, I didn't realize how many nonfiction books he'd written. He's somewhere around 50 nonfiction books. But my narration has been of his series of novels, and it's a the 21 gun series, correct? Is that that 21 guns? Yeah, 21 guns, and the goal is 21 books. There you go, 21 books. He's <laughs> very ambitious. And before we dive into those, though, tell us a little bit about your author's journey and, and maybe a little bit about, you know, just an overview of, of some of the things you've you've already done. Sure. Well, so even though uh, the book you narrated, The Noted Desperado, Pancho Dumez, even though it was only published uh, a couple years ago, I actually started writing this when I was 19 years old. I, I had not had any uh, book published yet. And, uh, you know, I, I really wanted to do novels. But uh, novels, you know, it's typically for novels, you've got to get an agent and get your foot in the door with the publisher. And I was always trying to do that, and I could never get an agent. But uh, I got a lucky break. I had a friend who did a, a blog website called My Strange New Mexico, which was all about uh, various New Mexico lore and legend and just odd stories, hence the name. And uh, I enjoyed his articles, and I would send him little email messages about strange uh, stories uh, that I had heard. And uh, his name was Mike Smith. And Mike uh, invited me to have my own blog on his website, just focused on Roswell. And that kind of got my foot in the door in terms of writing. And then what happened next is uh, Mike also wrote for Arcadia Publishing. He did a really great book called Towns of the Sandia Mountains. And he said that they wanted somebody to do Roswell, but they didn't know who to reach out to. And so he just connected them with me. And that began my journey into uh, the world of writing because those little Arcadia books, they're easy to do. You basically need to round up a bunch of really beautiful vintage images, then come up with captions and chapter introductions. So it's a great way to write a first book because it's nice and easy. So that was my first one. And that uh, got me rolling. And, and like Boyd said, now I'm up to around 50 nonfiction titles. That's incredible. I can actually remember, I, I remember seeing those books that you're talking about that you started with. I've, I've seen them on shelves all over. Um, now, let's go back to when you first contacted me, because if I remember right, you were thinking about, once you'd, you'd started writing these novels, you were thinking about narrating them yourself, correct? Yeah, that was a crazy idea, too. <laughs> I, I realize now how time-consuming and difficult that would have been. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so so you called me and uh or contacted me online and just asked if because you had heard that I was doing it and just ask for some advice. So I came and we we sat down and I just kind of gave you some of my advice. The the interesting thing is uh you you were about to do you we wanted to start out with the first of the books which is mm -hmm. the the it's a first person narration from a teenage boy's standpoint. And so when I saw that, I thought, well, there's no way I could do that. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and cause I always look to see if something is, is in my wheelhouse. But then I, uh, I read the second book in the series, which is not it, which is just from a, a, just a third person narration with the characters. And I was so, 
just taken by the the story and the writing. I loved it so much that I said, I've got to do this. I just, I have to do this book. And so I, I got back with you and I said, Hey, I, you know, I would love to do this. And, and we worked something out. And, and then that first book, which was the, the, the uh, first person narrator of, of, of a teenage boy, I did that one as well. And it's kind of interesting because I, I, dug into that a little bit and, and talked to actually talked to my narration coach. And he also has done something similar to that. And he said, people will give you the benefit of the doubt. If you're narrating a book, you don't, you know, I, I do female voices in the books all the time, but taking on that teenage, uh, first person was was interesting but i absolutely loved it that book was fantastic too so that's you know that's what we did now what about the origin story of these novels what i know you said you started writing when you were much younger but what 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 what's the basic idea for the for the series so i think the basic idea of to kick it off was when I was in middle school and they made us read books, I typically didn't like the the fiction that they forced us to read. And uh, the only one I liked was S.E. Hinton's The Outsiders. And so then I started reading her other books and I, I loved them so much. I really wanted to emulate them in some way. And uh, that's where, again, you know, the noted desperado Pancho Dumez comes in. He's a 14 year old boy that lives in Fort Sumner. Um, but basically, when I I just started writing him as a creative writing exercise, just just observing my parents one morning, I kind of uh, tapped into what it was like to be fourteen year old fourteen years old again, and just just started this story, not really knowing where it would go. And then I decided, well, I like these characters I created, which is Poncho and his older brother Dorado. And I thought, well, what what do I do with them now? And I thought, well, an adventure story would be really simple. Or, or a, sorry, a lost treasure type story, because that's kind of, uh, in an odd way, that's kind of the backbone of the adventures of Tom Sawyer, as mm -hmm. Tom and Huck Finn, they look for a treasure. It's not really important to the story. What's important to the story is Tom and Huck and all that. But so I just thought, okay, uh, I'll just put them on a lost treasure search. And I was like, well, what's interesting in my area? And, uh, you know, Roswell, we're about an hour both ways from either Lincoln or Fort Sumner, where Billy the Kid is really famous. And in Fort Sumner, Billy's uh, tombstone has been stolen a couple of times, which I just thought was really interesting. Mm -hmm. And uh, while that was percolating in my brain, and again, this will show you how long ago that was, uh, Nicolas Cage's National Treasure movie came out. Oh, wow. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's a pretty, the movie itself is really good, but if you just pitch the movie without having seen it, that it's about a treasure map on the back of the Declaration of Independence, it sounds incredibly stupid, but it's executed well. So mine is similar. Mine is, I, I just came up with a story that, okay, the reason why Billy the Kid's tombstone gets stolen so much is because there's a treasure map hidden inside of it somehow. And then that's where the story snowballed from. And I was like, okay, it's about a 14 year old boy lives in Fort Sumner and uh, the, it's going to have something to do with Billy, the kid's tombstone and his grave and the mystery of his death. And it, and that's, so that's the first book, you know, again, it's very uh, S.E. Hinton like. Then the second book though, is more like Tony Hillerman. It's a totally different writing style. Mm -hmm. The characters are adults. And so uh, I have to say something funny you're not the only one who bypassed the first book just to go to the second one. So mm -hmm. uh, my best friend's mother, I had given her a copy of the first book and I, I just kind of noticed she, she started it, didn't finish it. And then I gave her this one when it was published once upon a time in Fort Sumner, she couldn't remember. She didn't realize they were connected. Well, she started reading this one and she loved it. She devoured it within a day or two. And she told me how much she loved it. And she was like, Oh, is there a sequel? And I said, well, actually, that that book that you didn't like and you never finished is the sequel. But and I think then because she had an appreciation for the universe that was set in, she read the first one. So right, right. And and I want us to talk a little bit about the whole time frame thing. But but before we do, I have to tell the audience that this is a genre, kind of all of its own. I've never read anything like it. There's uh there's fantasy, there's horror, there's old west there's 
legend, uh, comedy, coming of age, even a sprinkle of romance. I mean, it's it's got everything. And um, when when you were when you were thinking about this, who did you think your audience was? So on that very first one, I was thinking for, uh, you know, again, the middle grade audience. But actually, I think it's probably adults who enjoy all of the books more. Um, so it's definitely changed a lot. And I, I originally I didn't and I didn't intend 21 books. I think I was thinking just one little trilogy and it would just be, again, based off of, uh, I guess you call it the timeline in this book. Mm -hmm. Lenota Desperado, which is set in the 1970s. But uh, I kept getting ideas for prequels and spinoffs. And then it hit me. Well, what if uh, what if it was kind of like Star Wars where you went backwards? You know, you, you you start with this book in 1976. Then the sequel, prequel, whatever you want to call it, set in 1950. So basically right. the storyline in the present questions are asked and then because that's typical of all films you know you ask questions in the storyline that are answered in the sequel well in this case the questions are asked and then they're answered in the prequels and you get the answers to the questions and and so on and yeah yeah it's it's kind of an interesting deal because that's exactly what's happening you're going back and in and the third one you're working on now is even farther back in time correct yeah the third one you know the focus of the whole trilogy is basically billy the kid and the uh the third one stars Billy. This is Logan Pack's uh, proto cover. It's a sketch oh, cover. Great. I haven't seen that oh, yet. God, All right. Yeah. 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 yeah and I, I told him, I said, I don't want it to look like the historical Billy the Kid. I want it to be like if uh, this were a movie and an actor were playing Billy, you know, so mm -hmm. people will kind of get that the realism isn't really the aim here. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, there's there's so much history. It's it's almost kind of a some sometimes it's an all alternate universe type history in all of yeah. these you know it, it, john is very much a historian you know i mean he he knows his stuff but he he puts some twists and tweaks to the actual history that that make the story the stories what they are so uh now for for those hopefully there will be some other uh, authors as well as some some other um audiobook narrators who are watching this. Um, so let's, let's talk to them a little bit about the process. I know, you know, we, we sat down for several lunches and, and we talked about the voices and it, it John is really great about uh, helping come up with voices because those of you who are audiobook narrators, you realize uh, you have to almost cast your book. You have to come up with with either actors that you're familiar with or people in your life that you're familiar with, so that you can you can pin a voice and a and an, uh, a personality to that character when you're portraying them in the book. And so we would sit down and and, and uh, John would have a list. He'd say, okay, this is this is who I was thinking about when I was writing this character. And that's so helpful. For those of you who are authors, and if you are working with uh with narrators, that's very, very helpful. So John, talk about that a little bit. When when you're writing, you have you have actual actors or people in mind? Yeah. So when I was younger and I did the first book, you know, the the note of Desperado, Pancho Dumez. I, I didn't really have an actor in mind for Pancho. He was his own unique creation. But when it came to the people around him, everybody was just an actor or a character that would catch my eye. And then I would just kind of do my own version of them, frankly. And, uh, you know, I don't mind saying who was who, but I, I don't know what the legalities are and stuff right, like that. So right, maybe yeah. I shouldn't. Yeah. You don't have to say, but yeah. Yeah. But yeah, it, was, so, it was cool. Yeah. And, and, and yeah. as a narrator, what that does, I, and I don't think John was never asking me to sound exactly like somebody, but he said, this was who I had in mind. So if I had that same actor in mind, yeah, then my, my personality and, and a little bit of the voice, sometimes I would catch the voice pretty well, but even if I didn't catch the voice, I would try to say, I'm, I'm trying to embody that, how that actor would do the, the character. So yeah. <laughs> that's what we did. Um, 
and uh, so we were it, it was it was very much a collaboration um whereas i was trying to bring to audio as faithfully as possible what john had in his head when he was writing um and uh and it was just it was a joy and and you know we're going to continue to to do these as he as he um as he keeps going here um now you mentioned logan pack the the covers yeah you, know, you you've you've held up the covers i'll put some you know on on the uh on this video i'll put some of those up uh, logan has done all the the covers talk about that that collaboration yeah so uh I, we have a little fun convention here in roswell called galacticon and uh, i had always known logan but uh, i was at galacticon and we have a, a man here in town named matt bromley who makes his own board games and he had done this pirate board game and he had done he had gotten logan to do the box art for it and i was looking at it and i was like why did i never think to ask logan to do the artwork on my book he's just so perfect because he has this this unique style i to me there's nobody quite like logan in my opinion and it's very western and cool and so yeah i'd always known logan and i was like yes. well I'll just ask logan to do it and i'm very <laughs> pleased with it you know, same way with Logan, I kind of give him subtle notes that secretly, you know, this character is really this actor and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and hopefully some people can kind of recognize who they are and, and <laughs> things like that. Oh, he is. He's an unbelievable artist. I actually used him before for a uh, a production I've done called uh, Come and See, which is the story of Jesus as if it happened, well, you know, in, in, in somebody's head, it's like dropping mm -hmm. them in the in the midst of uh of the action and the words and he did he did the drawings or the the artwork for that for that and unbelievably well yeah. um also we have for the audiobooks we have a, a soundtrack by brian hunley now logan mm -hmm. and brian are both here in in roswell and brian did an unbelievable job with the soundtrack uh we again i had uh I had John give him some ideas he had in his head, music that he might have even listened to while he was writing or whatever. Yeah, and, I do that for sure. Yeah, and so so Brian was able to take those notes and create something that was unique to this series, but it's it it, it captures some of. Them. So tell us a little bit about that. How how did how did that uh, the music, the soundtrack come across to you? Yeah, I loved uh, Brian's themes he came up with. They blew me away because they're very westerny. And then there's a few beats in there that kind of remind me of the Japanese Godzilla music of all things, just oh, in wow. odd little ways, uh -huh. um, which is another thing I really like. So, yeah, I was uh, very impressed with it. And and some of the music he wrote so, is helping me as I as I write this next book, I can kind of listen to it as I write it. And it, it yes. helps like I'm doing a stagecoach chase scene right now that suits uh one of the themes he did pretty well oh perfect that's fantastic um it 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 really is uh, a unique experience for a narrator to work closely with an author and I've I've done that with a few now and it's just it's a it's a collaboration kind of unlike anything else and um so I I appreciate you know being able to to bring your works to life, John, um, and I I can't recommend these books enough for those of you who are listening to this. If you're a reader, and you maybe you don't enjoy listening to audiobooks, that's fine. Go buy the books and read them; they're fabulous. But if you want the audio treatment, if you want a, a kind of a crazy ride with a lot of fun voices, then join me in the the audio world of, of these books um and you'll find links we'll wherever this interview gets posted we'll put links to to all these things um so john anything else that that you would like to to share about about the books or about our process sure well i'll, I'll concur to listeners that uh you did a fantastic job just because you know i'm sick of those books in terms of like reading them again <laughs> Because you proofread your own books a lot, especially if you're independently publishing, you've got to be your own yeah. proofer and your own editor. So I've read these books a million times. And uh, when I listened to Boyd's version, it was like 
getting to experience my book again for the first time from a different perspective. So I loved it and I had a blast uh, listening to it. So yeah, if you're an audiobook person, uh can't re recommend it enough. Yeah. Well, that's great. Um and you know, thank you again for for the opportunity and and thanks for your time uh just sharing about this a little bit. I hope that it is something that will encourage other narrators and authors uh, because sometimes a narrator never gets to meet the author. Uh, if you're working maybe for a, a big publisher or something, which I, I haven't really done for a, one of the big, big, big publishers. Um, and I, th I think it's, it's helpful to get the, you know, the, the input from the, from the one who wrote the book. So it's, it's wonderful. Um, uh, Okay. Well, John, thanks again. And uh, and one of these days, I'll be back with another narrator interviews author uh, segment. So until then, bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you, Boyd.